Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. I'd encourage you to read the New Testament first, then read the Old Testament, and you're like, well, isn't a book usually read from, you know, the beginning to the end? Yes, but you need to read the Old Testament through the lens of the New, and you won't get caught up in the law and other things that were a part of his relationship with Israel, but we're all pointing ultimately to our need for his son Jesus, who is fleshed out entirely in the New Testament. In today's broadcast, we have part two of Pastor Sam's message, Born Again and Alive in Him. We're taking up in verse 14 of the Gospel of John and we'll complete the chapter today. We're finishing up looking at Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus and then we'll look at the words of John the Baptist regarding the Messiah, our Lord, Jesus Christ. So let's listen in. Then he uses an illustration that Nicodemus would have been very familiar with. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, we read verse 14, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, some of you read through the Old Testament. If you haven't, highly recommended reading. If you're brand new to Scripture, I'd encourage you to read the New Testament first, then read the Old Testament. And you're like, well, isn't a book usually read from, you know, the beginning to the end? Yes, but you need to read the Old Testament through the lens of the New, and you won't get caught up in the law and other things that were a part of his relationship with Israel. But we're all pointing ultimately to our need for his son, Jesus, who is fleshed out entirely in the New Testament. Anyway, um, he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, it takes us back to the book of Numbers. It's chapter 21. God's people had been freed miraculously by God. Ten mighty signs, plagues led to their release from bondage in Egypt. By the way, they went down to Egypt. When they went down, there were 70 of them. And when they came out, there were thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, some say a few million. But the important thing to note is they came out a mighty nation as God told Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, he would make of them. The other issue is though, now they're out of that 400 years of bondage and they're wandering in the wilderness. And uh, when they get hungry, they cry out and God gives them manna from heaven. When they're thirsty, smite the rock. He gives them water from a rock in the wilderness. And at this point though, they're a little fed up with Moses and sadly with God. And they begin to complain and murmur saying, you brought us out here just to let us die in the wilderness. And they said, you know, and we're hungry and we're thirsty and our soul, and this is where they cross the line, our soul loathes this worthless bread. Now there are a lot of things that God puts up with, but that's not one he's okay with. He understood when they were hungry. Our kids whine in the car when they're hungry or when they're thirsty. And well, my kids are like 40 years old, but that doesn't mean they don't do that. <laughs> but the point is that, that he understood when they were hungry and thirsty. He didn't do well with them saying, our soul loathes this worthless manna. Now, he sent fiery serpents among them. They began to bite them and people began to die. And whenever that happened in the wilderness, they would run to Moses and say, pray for us. Oh, do something, you know. And so Moses goes to God and God says, make a fiery serpent and hold it up. And uh, when anyone looks, it's a bronze serpent, by the way. When anyone looks at the, the bronze serpent, whoever looks at it will live. So Moses does what God instructs. Does it make sense? It makes sense because God said to do it. That's the only reason it makes sense. Uh, ordinarily, you know, making a bronze serpent to imitate snakes biting everybody isn't going to be a solution. But in this case, God said to do it and he did it. And anyone who looked on that bronze serpent, they lived even if they'd been bitten. Now listen, we've all been bitten. We've been bitten by sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, the gift of God, everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So here's, here's what 
Nicodemus is, is getting. What whoever believes um, in him, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Clearly a reference to his coming cross, that whoever believes in him should not perish. That word means not annihilation, but it means the end of life as they know it should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, listen, the life we're living for believers and unbelievers, it's a temporal life. Once we're in Christ, we have everlasting life. So our real life, the one that goes on forever, it's yet ahead for us. Every good thing we're experiencing now will pale in comparison to what he has planned for us in the future. But those who are living in the flesh never come to faith in Christ. They die in their sins. They perish. But it's not annihilation because Jesus teaches after death, everyone will be conscious after death, everyone will know, hey, I'm dead. But those of us in Christ will go, whoa, I'm dead, but here I am alive in the presence of God. Instantaneously, absent from the body, present with the Lord. The unbeliever, well, they will stand before God as well. But when they do, it will be in judgment. So there's the first resurrection, it's called. You want to be a part of that. Every born again believer will be a part of the first resurrection. And the second resurrection is a resurrection unto judgment. The first, a resurrection to everlasting life. Well, verse 16, and most of us are familiar with it. For God so loved the world, talking about the motivation for sending his son to die for our sins. It talks about the the power of that motivation. He didn't just love the world. He so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The word only begotten is the only born one, the one and only like himself. The only one who preexisted with the father came from the father, was born miraculously, lived sinlessly, died for our sins on the cross, rose again, and ascended into heaven. He says in verse 17, and it's important, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't come to condemn because we were already condemned. If his plan was to condemn, all he had to do was stay home with the Father. All of mankind is under the curse. All mankind was uh, headed to eternity without the Lord. But Jesus bridged that gap through the cross, through the life he gave, the death he died for our sins. Well, he who believes in him is not condemned. So important. But he who does not believe, and this is what I was trying to say, is condemned already because he has not believed in the only begotten Son of God. All sin, so all are condemned. This is the condemnation, that the light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. It's so important that we get this. The word for loving darkness here is the same word when it says God so loved the world. He loved us sacrificially. He loves us unconditionally. And he's saying men love the darkness the way he loves us. That's why they embrace the darkness and they sacrifice themselves for the things they do in the darkness. There's something else, though. When he talks about um, everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds be exposed as evil. To practice evil says they have a lifestyle of evil. 
And by the way, he says that's where we all were. We were enemies of God. We lived in the darkness. We were deceived. We were depraved. There are so many ways he describes us outside of him and before he came into our lives and began to transform us. And so until people come to grips with the fact that they're in need, they don't repent and cry out for forgiveness. Hopefully you've all done that. If you haven't, I pray you will today. Somebody did last service. We rejoice with her. We celebrate her salvation. And listen, today is the day of salvation. If you're in Christ, you need to be sharing these things with people you know. Because you might think, well, we all know this. Well, we all may know it, but they all haven't even heard it. To practice evil means to have a lifestyle of evil, a lifestyle of hate, a lifestyle of darkness, a lifestyle of death that leads to death. But he who does the truth, this is the contrast, comes to the light that his deeds may clearly be clearly seen that they have been done in God. All who come to and walk in Jesus, follow after him, become like him. Jesus, he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows after me will not walk in darkness. So he brings us out of the darkness out of the deception, away from the depravity, out of death, into life and light and hope and joy and holiness, all of that in him. So um, he says, I'm the light of the world. Follow after me. You will not walk in darkness. And then he tells his disciples later on, and he would be saying to us today, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Talked about practicing evil, a lifestyle of evil. He's saying a lifestyle of good works done for his glory, walking in the light, people will take notice an opportunity will be given for you to share that he's the difference in you, that he lives in you, that he's forgiven you, and that there's hope for them as well. Well, verse 22, we continue on. After these things, a phrase John will use again and again here in the gospel, in the book of Revelation. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, there he remained with them and baptized, and John was baptizing near Anon, near Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. And there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. The Jews were very concerned about uncleanness, but it never had to do with hygiene. Well, I'm not saying moms didn't care about hygiene, but that wasn't their primary issue. We'll see this going forward. So this just is sort of lays the foundation for multiple references to the idea that there's clean and unclean. And for them, uncleanness was about contact with anything or anyone that was unclean. It was a ceremonial thing. It made them unfit for worship or service or fellowship. So it's a huge issue. That's what they're talking about, purification. Why are they talking to John the Baptist about it? Because he's calling men to repent of sin and be baptized publicly for the remission, the purification, if you will, of their sins. So Jesus, in our very next chapter, will meet with a woman who has conversation with him. He initiates the conversation, by the way. And when the disciples come and see she's talking to a woman, they're just as surprised that the woman was that he would even converse with her. And when she, you know, gets, well, anyway, I, we'll, we'll be there next week and Lord willing. And, uh, but the whole point is, it's all about that, that, issue of purification, something, by the way, something only God can actually do is to purify our hearts and to purify our minds 
And I pray he'll do both for every one of us today. Well, they came to John and said, Rabbi, verse 26, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you've testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. What's going on here is John the Baptist has a group of men who heard him in the wilderness preaching and calling others to repentance and they begin to follow him. They became disciples of John the Baptist. Now he's already pointed to Jesus and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But his loyal followers, and listen, loyalty, it is a wonderful, godly characteristic. It's often lacking today. It's one we want to develop, loyalty to our, our wives, loyalty to our families, to our fellowship, to, to the work God's called us to, to each other. But, but it's a good and godly attribute, but it requires humility. And John represents so beautifully that reality. John answers and says, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. Given to him from above. His response is a revelation from heaven that our gifts, natural and supernatural, physical and spiritual, they're all gifts from God. If you're musical, God's made you musical. If you think like an engineer, God's made you logical. If, you, um, if you're artistic, God's made you artistic. And you know, you can use whatever he gives you for his glory or for yours. And that, that's really the only difference because all of the physical gifts come from him. True for spiritual gifts as well, but spiritual gifts should only and must only be used for um, the glory of God should be true for all of our gifts, but billions of people are, are ignorant of him. So they have gifts from him. They're not even thankful to him. But we know better. And John knew better. And, and I love it because he says, a man can receive nothing unless it's given to him from heaven. And you yourselves bear me witness. You remember, you heard me, he's saying. I said, I am not the Christ, but have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. I love this. He's taken us back to that theme of the bride and the bridegroom, the church, the bride of Christ, Jesus, the groom, of course. And he's saying, listen, in a wedding, the best man doesn't fret because the groom and the bride are being wed. No, he's there to celebrate with them. I do have a question about how they end up calling the best man the best man because she should be marrying the best man, shouldn't she? But nevertheless, that's how it's laid out. And he's just saying, look, I'm like the best man here. I'm just here to celebrate the unity of the bride and the groom. And so he gets the ministry he's in. He understands the work he's called to. And he's telling us humility, it's a key, the key to joyful service in the Lord. Instructed to do all things as unto him. Instructed to do all things for his glory. He says, my joy is fulfilled. It's literally overflowing. And for that to happen in your life and mine, there needs to be more of him and less of us. He must increase. And for that to happen, we must decrease. The picture is we're 100% of us. Then we come to Christ and we give him a chunk of us. And he's like, I need the whole thing for this to work for me. I need all of you, every part. That's why he says to love him with all our heart and soul and mind and strength with all that's in us. But he can't get more of me if I'm still on the throne of my life, nor can he with you. So what, what John is just saying is that for him to increase, which he must, I must and we must decrease. Then he goes on to say, he who comes from above, returning to that theme, is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above 
all. John is the last of his dispensation. John the Baptist, by the way. The law and the prophets are unto John. He points to Jesus. Jesus starts a whole new thing, the age of grace, where it's not about the law or works or our best efforts or our good intentions. It's all about what he's done for us and is doing in us and doing through us. So he gets all the glory. Jesus is the only one who came down from heaven. That's a theme I mentioned. John 6 will fully develop, so we'll see it there. What he's seen and heard, he testifies, and no one receives his testimony, but he who has received it, and when he says no one, he's not saying no one in the entirety, but he's saying most aren't. But he who has received his testimony, has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. The one whom God has sent speaks the words of God and does not give the Spirit by measure. That phrase, the one whom God has sent 39 times in John, it's used 16 times in the 21 chapters of John. And so 39 times in all, uh, 16 in John. And, and listen, the, the phrase is, the one God sent speaks the words of God. And he doesn't have the spirit by measure. Jesus will read at one point from Isaiah 61.1, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who were bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord in the day of vengeance of our God. He reads all the way up to those last few words. He closes the scroll or rolls up the scroll, says today these words are fulfilled in your ears. He doesn't read the day of vengeance of our God. That's yet ahead in his second coming, just prior to it, seven years of it. But he's saying the spirit of the Lord is upon me and without measure. And then he says to, to preach and, and to heal and to proclaim liberty in the opening of the prison to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Listen, he wants to fill us and use us in the very same way in our day. The father loves the son, we read in verse 35, and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the son has everlasting life. Not believe stuff about him, believes in him and into him and, well, into salvation from him. And he who does not believe the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. No issue more important, no question more needed. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Because if you do, then you have life in him. And if you don't, man, come to him today and tell others about him. In verse 30 of our study today, John the Baptist stated that Jesus must increase, but I must decrease. Now, while that certainly applied to John's ministry, I do not believe that it only applies to John, as I believe it applies to each and every one of us who are in Christ. So how do we do that? Listen to what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 16, 24. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now I find at the beginning of every new year, I start working on all of the things that I want to accomplish in the new year. Now Jesus doesn't have an issue with this, but he does want me to make myself available to him to do the work of the kingdom. Therefore, one good application of this is to keep our eyes and ears open for what the Lord may call us to do and be willing to set aside our own agendas in order to fulfill the call on our lives that he places. In doing this, we're not only denying ourselves of the desires of our flesh, as many of our agendas are powered by the desires of our flesh, but we are also decreasing so that he may increase. 
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.